Record it started. Okay. Over to you, Yola. So let's get this. Let's get this just here. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Exploring Seaweeds presentation, where we'll explore seaweeds that thrive inside the tide. Can everyone hear me? No? No? Okay. I'll try and shout. So my name is Dr. Yola Medi. I'm a phycologist. A phycologist is someone who studies algae, and I specialize in marine seaweeds. And my job is to look for, find, name, and research seaweeds. So currently for my research, I'm focusing on three tribes in the family Rhodomalaceae, which are a group of red seaweeds, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The Rhodomalaceae, the whole family, encompasses about 564 species worldwide. And I'm exploring the phylogenetics and taxonomy of the Australian species in that group, which currently includes around 155 species. Now, when most people hear the word seaweed, they think of the stuff rotting and smelling up on the beach. But that's not what seaweeds are all about. It's like comparing a pile of leaves in your front yard with a forest, they're just not the same. But even these piles of seaweed on the beach provide food and shelter for beach organisms like shrimp, crab, worms, and even some birds. And it all eventually breaks down and sends important nutrients back into the ocean. Underwater seaweeds are beautiful while they're alive and growing. And they show gorgeous colors like bright pinks and reds and vibrant greens. And you can even see amazing iridescent colors like in these pictures. Underwater, they're not the mess that you find on the beach. Then just look at like the kelps and how much life there is in there. You find seals and sharks and all sorts of cool things in there. And it really is an underwater forest. <clears throat> Louder, okay. So what is a seaweed? Seaweeds are algae that live in marine environments. Seaweeds cover an incredible range of organisms from microscopic plankton to kelps as tall as trees. Okay, what is algae? Well, this is a rather interesting definition. Basically, algae is a group of photosynthesizing organisms that are not plants and are not bacteria. So they're defined by what they're not. And this definition actually currently encompasses six separate kingdoms. Fun to study. So all seaweeds photosynthesize, they use up carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. Chlorophylls are the pigments that capture the sunlight to be used in photosynthesis. And the unique combination of five different chlorophylls gives seaweeds their different colors. I think we're actually up to seven chlorophylls now. So seaweeds are actually divided by their colors in big, broad groups. There's green, red, and brown. We're very imaginative. But these divisions are more than just due to their color. There are significant morphological and developmental differences between these three groups. For example, red seaweeds have no flagellated cells at any stage of life, whereas the other two groups do. We also have phylogenetic support for the recognition at separate groups. The red algae, the green algae, and the brown algae. So on this diagram, it's a basic marine tree of life. And every word that you see at the end of a line is a different group, like sponges or tunicates or turtles. And so here you see how far apart the algae and the lines just show our best guess at their relationships. So on a basic marine tree of life, put together from data, from DNA data, we see that algae are clearly divided into three separate groups, at least three separate groups, based on their molecular makeup as well. So seaweed parts are named differently than land plant parts. We're used to saying leaf and stem and roots for plants, but with seaweeds, we've got other terminology. The whole plant is called a plant still, or more commonly a thallus. What we call leaves on a plant, we call blades on a seaweed. Those are the compressed parts. 
Some seaweeds have floats filled with gas, which help them stay upright under the water. So this is to maximize exposure to sunlight for photosynthesis. Branches are the round parts or terete parts um, and the thinner sections of the seaweed. A stipe is the part that attaches the plant to the holdfast. And the holdfast actually holds the plant down. Its only purpose is to grip the surface and anchor the plant. All right, for the rest of this presentation, we're gonna focus on examples of these three divisions of seaweeds. For the red group, we'll look at a current subject of my research and my favorite, the Laurentia. For the green seaweeds, we'll look at the genus Codium. And for the brown seaweeds, we're gonna look at a subset of browns known as the kelps. And both Codium and the kelps are highlighted right here inside the tide. So the genus Codium belongs to the green division of seaweeds and is actually found in the kingdom Plantae, along with red seaweeds and land plants. There are currently 166 accepted species of Codium, 30 of which are recorded as being here in Australia. Their morphology, the way they look, ranges from green globs on rocks to dichotomously branched plants up to about 30 centimeters tall. And the colors range from a deep green to a bright apple green. And all of them have a really interesting spongy texture. If you get a chance to touch these, they're really cool. An interesting fun fact about Codium is that the entire plant is actually made up of one cell. So it's branched, often tubular, has many nuclei, but actually this plant is unicellular. So Codium morphology has been specialized to its environment. So what's its environment? Codium species live in the intertidal zone as well as just in the subtidal zone. The subtidal zone is always underwater, but the intertidal zone is the area between the highest tide and the lowest tide. And the intertidal zone is not an easy place to live. Anything living here needs to be able to survive desiccation, trampling, freshwater runoff, and prolonged submersion. But Codium is well suited to intertidal life because of its shape and structure. Firstly, it's flexible. This is so it doesn't break in the waves. Imagine a stiff seaweed being bashed around, it would break a lot. Secondly, codium is branched. This increases surface area, allowing the plant to better filter water for nutrients and carbon dioxide. Thirdly, it's spongy. Being spongy helps codium hold water, which reduces desiccation. And lastly, codium has a really large holdfast, especially compared to its size. And this helps, it keep, helps keep it attached to the substrate when it's exposed to rough water coming back in. Now the Laurentia complex belongs to the red division of seaweeds and is also found in the kingdom Plantae. There are eight genera within this complex and currently the most speciose of them all is the Laurentia genus with about 162 recorded species. 97 of which are found in Australia, 97. <laughs> Laurentia plants are usually less than 30 centimeters tall, maybe around that big, and are always branched with a relatively medium-sized holdfast. Now this picture is a close-up of a Laurentia dendroidea branch. All growth occurs from one cell at the end of each branch called the apical cell and it's located in a pit at the tip of each branch, which this inset here is it's outlined by red, the shape of the branch tip, and the apical cell is represented by the yellow dot. So you can see it kind of sits in that pit. And this is actually a characteristic of um, one of Laurentia's identifying features. So do you wanna know if you got a Laurentia, you need to see this. And inside the branch, the cells are actually stacked onto each other as columns or tubes. 
So this effect is a many tubed looking branch or what we call polysiphonous. And actually this polysiphonous construction is also an identifying feature for actually the whole family of Rhodomalaceae. In this inset, you can see the stacked cells making four tubes. And in Laurentia, this construction is really difficult to see because cells build up around it and cover it up. So the only place you can see this feature is right at the very, very tips. So you can imagine how hard it is to identify Laurentia when its tips are all eaten off. Now, an interesting fun fact about Laurentia is that it produces the world's richest source of secondary metabolites. At last count, this included 1,047 unique secondary metabolites. And why is this interesting, you might be wondering? Well, firstly, secondary metabolites are produced by an organism during ecological interactions and not directly during regular plant development. For example, when a plant's being chewed on or it's being crowded in by rival plants, it produces a number of these secondary metabolites as a physical deterrent. And we've discovered that these secondary metabolites actually have fascinating properties. Some have been shown to be antiviral, big thing right now, antifungal, antibacterial, and even antifouling. So where you paint the hull of a boat and it stops organisms from growing on there. And really so many more. These chemicals have been the focus of an amazing array of studies around the world on this group. All right, now the kelps. Kelps are brown seaweeds in the kingdom Chromista and in the order Laminariales. This includes around 127 species worldwide with 11 species recorded here in Australia. Kelps are usually found in colder, more nutrient rich waters. But as you can see by the map, that also includes significant parts of Australia. Kelps can be found close to the shore, often in the subtidal zones and actually intertidally in some parts of the world. And they generally prefer rock substrates. They help protect coastlines from erosion by forming a living barrier that absorbs impact from swells, swells, waves, and tidal action. And you can see in the picture how close to shore they actually get and what a significant structure they become. And for scale, there's a couple people on the beach there. I don't know if you can see them. So they're actually huge structures. So kelps truly are the forests of the ocean, housing fish and animals of all kinds, from mammals to invertebrates, sponges, other seaweeds. And like forests on the land, kelps produce oxygen, they clean the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and provide habitat for a whole host of living creatures. And as I said, they protect land from erosion, not just on the surface, but under the shore as well, under the water as well. And this is what can happen to kelp forests when large scale changes occur in marine environments. This shows an entire kelp forest eaten by a sea urchin bloom, most likely caused by warming waters and fish stock reductions. This is actually fresh destruction. In a few days or weeks, the stumps on the rocks will be gone too. And notice the cloudiness of the water and the barren looking landscape. But all is not lost though. With effort, a lot of effort, the kelps can be restored. Here is a before and after photo of the Palos Verdes kelp forest in California. After restoration began in 2013 by removing the sea urchins, restocking fish populations, and transplanting a lot of kelp, 39 acres of rocky reef kelp forests were actually restored and a successful commercial sea urchin fishery was developed. But of course, prevention is always preferred. Kelps are primarily subtidal. They're often found in very deep water and actually close to shore, such as in a rocky underwater cliff. 
As we've seen for Codium, the intertidal zone is a challenging environment. However, the subtidal zone also has its challenges. Access to sunlight is critical. Sunlight runs out quickly the deeper the water is. Not enough sunlight means photosynthesis stops. Also, swells and wave action are two other big challenges. They can be rough and constant, and they can sweep seaweeds out to sea or worse onto the shore, particularly the juveniles that are trying to attach in the first place. So anything living subtidally needs to ensure access to sunlight and be able to hang on for like dear life. The kelps, of course, are well suited to their subtidal environment. Firstly, they are really sturdy, thick, but also flexible, really bendy. This, of course, reduces breakage due to waves and rough swell. Secondly, they have indeterminate growth. This allows the kelps to adapt to whatever depth they find themselves in. They grow quickly and up to the height needed to reach the surface. Some of these giant kelps can grow up to half a meter a day, up to 80 meters tall in a single season. Thirdly, most kelps have floats. These air bladders keep the plant upright to catch as much sunlight as possible. Again, this adaptation allows for plants to grow in really deep water. And lastly, kelps have humongous holdfasts. This absolutely anchors the kelp to the ground and keeps it there when big swells or rough currents come in. All right, so seaweeds and their environment. Seaweeds like Codium, the Laurentia, the kelps are all primary food producers. They photosynthesize and use carbon dioxide, they grow and they grow quickly, and then they become food for animals and even us humans. Seaweeds clean the water. Like most seaweeds, codium, kelps, and Laurentias are great water filters, taking out extra nutrients, taking out extra carbon dioxide, and even taking out toxins. They leave their environment cleaner than before they were there. Kelps or seaweeds make oxygen. Okay, now this is really important to us and the entire planet. Seaweeds actually make a lot of oxygen. They make more oxygen than all the trees on the planet put together. How is this possible? There are, there's a lot more ocean on the planet than land. So simply there are more seaweeds on the planet than trees. And codium fields and kelp forests are both great hideouts for a mind boggling number of organisms each with their own role to play in the environment. Nudibranchs, crabs, worms, invertebrates, sponges, little fish, humongous fish, seals, and even whales are among some of the creatures that can be found living in seaweed habitats. And seaweeds are actually homes for other seaweeds, which harbor their own set of creatures. So it's layer upon layer upon layer of life found in seaweed habitats. So what are some threats to our seaweeds and what can we do? So where seaweeds live are naturally stressful environments. So our best way of helping them survive is to take care of their environment, which is the beach and the intertidal zones. Remember to leave the beach as clean or even cleaner as it was when you got there. Take all the garbage with you. Garbage can smash up the seaweeds and rip them off the rocks. And it also blocks juvenile seaweeds from attaching on the rock in the first place. And leave natural things where they are. First thing to remember is never touch anything in a tide pool with your bare hands. As you probably already know, these mollusks are deadly poisonous. So you look or use a tool. And please don't take anything from the environment, of course, unless it's garbage. And if you do collect food from the ocean, respect the bag limits. Small changes up here can mean big changes for the seaweeds. And thirdly, you really could just share what you know about seaweeds. Not many people know what you've just learned. 
that seaweeds clean the water, make most of the oxygen we breathe, and are habitat and food for an amazing array of creatures. And maybe next time you see seaweed piled up on the beach, you might think about it a little differently. Thank <laughs> you.